In this video tutorial, we will introduce the concepts of thermal chemistry and calorimetry. Thermal chemistry is the study of energy changes involved in chemical and physical processes. Energy is the ability to do work. It cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be converted from one form into another. This is known as the law of conservation of energy. In general, there are two forms of energy. The first is kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. When it comes to atoms and molecules, they may have translational, rotational, and vibrational energies. All right, so translation is the movement of the molecule, rotational as it rotates, and vibrational as it moves back and forth. The second major category is that of potential energy, and that is the energy stored within an object as a result of its condition. Examples of this are gravitational potential energy and the energy stored within chemical bonds. When a portion of energy disappears from some place, it must reappear in some other place in a different form. For example, a diver has potential energy because he is high above the level of the water. As he jumps, his potential energy decreases with his decreasing height. At the same time, his kinetic energy increases as he gains speed heading downwards. Potential energy is transformed into another form, kinetic energy. When he hits the water, his kinetic energy is transformed into the work needed for pushing aside masses of water. We can see that during the whole jump, his total energy remains the same. One form of energy is just transformed into others. This rule is summarized by the law of conservation of energy, which states that the total amount of energy in the universe is constant. Now let's introduce some key terms that we're going to be using throughout this unit. The first is thermal energy, and that is the sum total of all kinetic energy within a sample of matter. So that would include all the vibrational, rotational, and translational energy of every atom inside your body. Now that cannot be measured. We have no device that can actually do that. So we use temperature instead, All right, that we can measure. Temperature is directly related to the average kinetic energy for the system. So although we cannot find the exact amount of kinetic energy, we can find the overall average for that particular sample. Now specific heat capacity is the amount of energy measured in joules required to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. And this is a physical property that is unique to each substance. So for instance, water has a very high specific heat capacity, about 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius, meaning that if I want to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius, it would require 4.18 joules of energy to do so. Now since thermal energy itself within a substance cannot be directly measured, we can instead measure changes in thermal energy, either loss or gain, by that system. And this can be done using one of two equations. The first is Q equals mc delta t, where Q is the energy released or absorbed measured in joules, m is the mass of the substance measured in grams, c is its specific heat capacity measured in joules per gram degree Celsius, and delta t is the change in temperature, either measured in Celsius or Kelvins. Now, unlike grade 11 chemistry where you had to convert all Celsius values into Kelvins, because we're dealing with a change in temperature, you can measure uh, temperature in either Celsius or Kelvins because they are the same magnitude. So an increase of 15 degrees Celsius is the same as an increase of 15 Kelvins. They just have different starting points, that's all. The second equation we can use is Q equals ML. This is typically used to measure thermal energy loss or gain during changes in state. So when you're boiling or freezing something, for instance. Again, Q is the heat involved, or the energy involved, measured in joules. M is the mass. Typically, it's going to be measured in kilograms, however. And L is the latent heat of fusion or vaporization, uh, which is the change in state, how much energy is required to change that state. And again, this value is unique to every single substance. So let's take a look at a sample question. If I have 250 grams of water at 75 degrees Celsius, and then I pour it into a tin can at 20 degrees Celsius, the final temperature of the system is found to be 48 degrees Celsius. So what is the mass of the tin can? So in this instance, we are pouring hot water, 75 degrees Celsius, into a colder tin can, 20 degrees Celsius. In so doing, the hot water will warm up the tin can, so it transfers its energy into the tin can until it reaches 48 degrees Celsius. It is important to keep in mind that the final temperature of the tin can is also the final temperature of the water. Energy typically moves from high to low, so from hot to cold. You never see a cold tin can warming up the hot water. 
So the moment the tin can becomes more warm than the water, you will reach a thermal equilibrium where the tin can will start to warm up the water and then vice versa. So both end up at the same final temperature. Now to solve this problem, we're going to use the same equation twice, Q equals MC delta T. When calculating the change in temperature, so delta T, you must always subtract the initial from the final. So it's always T final, final temperature, minus the initial temperature. This will provide you with a proper sign to show you whether the substance had lost or gained energy. So in this case, the water started off at a temperature of 75 degrees Celsius, but ended with a final temperature of 48. So 48 minus 75 gives you a negative value, which is the negative symbol over here, showing that the water had lost energy. Again, C is the heat capacity, in this case for the water. Uh, heat capacity values are given to you, except water. Typically, you'll have to memorize that one yourself because we use it so often. But the heat capacity for other substances like tin, I would not expect you to memorize that. That will be given to you in a table. All right, so just uh, start memorizing the heat capacity of water. We're going to be using it quite a bit. 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then mass of the water itself is 250 grams. Once we solve for the equation, we find that water has lost, because of the negative sign, 28215 joules of energy. Because energy cannot be created or destroyed, the energy lost by the water doesn't just magically disappear, it must be gained by someone else, and in this case it's gained by the tin. Please note that Q water lost is a negative value because the water lost the energy, while Q tin gained is going to be a positive value because it was gained by the uh, tin. Please note that I specifically wrote down Q water M water, C water, Q tin, M tin, C tin, because I'm using the equation Q equals MC delta T twice. Once for the water, once for the tin. It's very important that you keep these values consistent. If you're looking for the amount of energy lost or gained by the water, you must use the mass of the water and the heat capacity of the water in order to calculate that. You can't mix and match using Q water, M tin, then C water. Uh, everything must be for water here, and everything in this equation must be for tin. This is a common mistake I see students uh, make when they're reading the questions. They'll mix and match temperature values for the wrong uh, substance or mix and match uh, mass values for the wrong substance. So please keep them uh, separate. Don't mix and match the values for different substances. All right, so negative 28215 joules of energy lost by the water is now gained. So it's positive value for the tin. Uh, the mass of tin is what we're trying to calculate. 0.21 joules per gram degree Celsius is the heat capacity of tin. It's not given in the question itself. You would have to look it up in a table, uh, or it would be given to you on a test. And then the final temperature minus the initial temperature, because it's going to be 48 minus 20, which is a positive value, so that uh, is energy gained instead. Once we rearrange the calculations, we get 4798.5 grams, which is 4.8 kilograms of uh, mass for the tin. All right, now in this second question, there's a slight problem because it involves a phase change. So what amount of heat is required to convert 2.5 kilograms of ice at negative 15 degrees Celsius into water at 30 degrees Celsius? So how much energy is involved to raise the temperature of 2.5 kilograms of ice, warming it up from negative 15 degrees Celsius all the way to 30 degrees Celsius? So what we'll have to do is measure the Q value, how much energy is involved, raising the temperature of ice from negative 15 to 0 degrees Celsius using Q equals MC delta T. But then during the phase change, the temperature does not change. All right, so ice melting remains at 0 degrees Celsius. So if the delta T doesn't change, that kind of wipes out your equation. So we have to use the MLF instead to uh, calculate the amount of energy involved with the uh, change of phase from melting ice into water. But once the water has been melted, then we can go back to Q equals MC delta T, uh, water is now 0 degrees Celsius, going up to 30 degrees Celsius, and finding out how much energy is involved with this particular part. So it's a three-parter. Calculate the amount of energy required to warm up the ice, the amount of energy required to melt the ice, and then the amount of energy to warm up the water, and then add them all up together for the total amount of energy required to do this. You'll notice that the heat capacity of ice is 2.01 joules per gram degree Celsius, whereas water is 4.18. So the heat capacity for ice versus water are different. They're the same substance, but they're not in the same state. So ice is able to absorb energy differently than if it was in its liquid state. Meanwhile, the latent heat of fusion is 3.3 times 10 to the power of 5 joules per kilogram uh, for turning ice into water, melting it. Again, these two values are things that will be given to you on a test or something that you'd have to look up in a chart. 
And once we add up these three values, we get about 1200 kilojoules of energy required. Now in this particular question, they were basing it on 2.5 kilograms of ice being used. However, a more useful unit in chemistry is kilojoules per mole, because quite often we will express quantities of uh, atoms in moles rather than kilograms. So when you measure the energy change in kilojoules per mole, it's called molar enthalpy. All right, so what you would do to convert into molar enthalpy is convert the mass into moles using the equation moles of the mass over molar mass. We found that we got 138.9 moles of ice. From there, divide the amount of energy that we had involved, 1200 kilojoules, divide by this many moles, and you get kilojoules per mole. So the molar enthalpy for, for this particular uh, physical change is 8.7 kilojoules of energy required per mole of ice warming up. Calorimetry is a technique used to measure the heat of chemical reactions or physical changes, so the amount of energy lost or gained during these physical or chemical changes. To do this, we require an instrument known as a calorimeter. Now this is a very simple calorimeter, but essentially you've got a thermometer to measure delta T, change in temperature. You've got a glass stirring rod in order to evenly distribute the energy in the particles during the reaction itself. Then we've got a cork stopper or a styrofoam cup in order to minimize energy exchange, both loss or gain of energy, between the system and its environment. Now, there are some assumptions we have to make when we're working with a calorimeter. The first is that no heat or energy is exchanged between the calorimeter and the environment. Obviously, that's not true. It's not possible to completely isolate a system. There will always be some kind of energy loss or gain. But these calorimetric experiments typically don't last very long, and so the amount of energy exchanged between the calorimeter and its environment should be negligible for the most part. So we'll just assume that no heat is exchanged in order to simplify our calculations. The second assumption we make is that all heat changes within the calorimeter are the result of the reaction taking place. So whatever energy change is measured by the thermometer is due to the reaction that we're studying. Again, that's not entirely true because temperature is defined as the average kinetic energy of a system, and we are using a glass stirring rod. And so when we're stirring inside the cup in order to evenly distribute the energy so that the thermometer gets a more accurate reading, by stirring the system, you're actually adding energy into the system. So it's not entirely true, but the amount of energy you add into the system should, again, be negligible. With more complicated or sophisticated uh, calorimeters, they actually tell you how much energy the uh, stirring device adds to the system so you can subtract it and make a more accurate uh, conclusion. Now, the third assumption we make is to assume that the reaction itself yields a 100% product. Obviously, that's not true. Percentage yields will change depending on the chemical reaction, but we're going to assume that 100% of the product is being produced in order to simplify our calculations. And finally, the last one, Dilute solutions are assumed to have the same density and specific heat capacity of pure water. So for instance, if I had a chemical reaction involving hydrochloric acid, as long as the hydrochloric acid is dilute enough, meaning that most of the solution, most of the acid is water, well, the heat capacity of water is much greater uh, than the heat capacity of the HCl itself. So it may not be necessary to factor in the heat capacity of the HCl when it's so minor in comparison to the heat capacity of the water. All right, so these four assumptions are typically used in order to help us simplify our calculations without a significant impact upon our results. Now down here is where we would normally do a lab. Essentially, we would have five unknown salts, and each salt would then be dissolved inside a calorimeter. We would then measure the temperature change for the dissolution process, and using Q equals MC delta T, determine the amount of energy involved for that dissolution. You would then take your kilojoules of energy, divide by the mass of the salt you have, and then measure it in kilojoules per gram, and look it up in a table to compare to find out which salt is uh, the most likely identity for each of these five unknown powders. This is how medical code packs work. Uh, essentially, you would have the salt over here separated by a very thin plastic membrane uh, surrounded by water. Once you squeeze, the uh, thin plastic membrane pops, the water comes in, dissolves the salt, and then you'll have a change in temperature, in this case, a code pack decreasing the temperature, and allowing us to use it instead of an ice pack, for instance. The same goes for hot packs, you would just use different salts, ones that would be exothermic and give off energy instead. So this would let us determine which of the five salts is best suited for use in a medical code pack.